Hi, I'm Nicola Jennings, one of the co-founders of Athena Art Foundation. This is Athena Asks, a podcast where we talk to artists, curators, historians and collectors about their work, pre-modern art and the world today. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Madeline Haddon, curator at the Victoria and Albert Museum and member of the Brain Trust of the Athena Art Foundation. And I'm delighted to have as our guest today two brilliant and dear colleagues, Dr. David Pullins, Associate Curator of European Paintings at the Met, and Dr. Vanessa Valdez, Associate Provost for Community Engagement at the City College of New York. David and Vanessa are the curators of the Met's blockbuster show, Juan de Pareja, Afro-Hispanic Painter, which opened to the public in March and is on view until July 16th. To give you a bit of background on both David and Vanessa, David Pullen studied art history at Columbia University, the Courtauld Institute of Art, and Harvard University, where he received his PhD in 2016. After holding fellowships at Dunbarton Oaks, Harvard University Art Museums, and CASVA, he taught at MIT and served as assistant curator at the Frick Collection. At the Met, he helps to develop, research, and present 17th and 18th century French, Italian, and Spanish painting. Vanessa K. Valdez is the Associate Provost for Community Engagement at the City College of New York. She's the former interim Dean of Macaulay Honors at CUNY and former director of the Black Studies Program. A graduate of Yale and Vanderbilt Universities and professor of Spanish and Portuguese, her research interests focus on the cultural production of Black peoples throughout the Americas, United States, and Latin America, including Brazil and the Caribbean. She is the editor of The Future Is Now, a new look at African diaspora studies, Let Spirit Speak, Cultural Journeys Through the African Diaspora, and Racialized Visions, Haiti and the Hispanic Caribbean. She's also the author of Diasporic Blackness, The Life and Times of Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. David, Vanessa, thank you so much for being in conversation with me today. And as you know very well, um, this exhibition has had a particularly special place in my heart as I was honored to be asked by both of you in 2021 to serve on its stellar advisory committee um, and to be featured on the audio guide discussing Murillo's Three Boys. So it's been a particular joy to see all of the incredible responses the exhibition has been getting um, and all of the praise you have both so deservingly received for what I know has been a very long journey. And I'm excited to unpack it today. So for listeners who have not seen Juan de Pereja after Hispanic painter, can you give us a brief overview of the exhibition and highlight some of its key points and arguments? Um, I know this is a difficult question as there are so many complexities and layers packed into this exhibition that's part of its brilliance. But what do you see as uh, the exhibition's kind of core three arguments? Well, I think we it's an exhibition that uh, as you encounter it, uh, you step into 17th century Spain by way of uh, 20th century New York by way of Arthur Schomburg. So really it's his framing that is that's so key for our sort of reframing the story of Arturo Schomburg is someone born in Puerto Rico, which was then a Spanish colony, whose mission from childhood was to find everything he could about global Black history. The story is that as a child, that a school teacher said that Black people had no history. And so from that moment, that laid the groundwork for this life-consuming mission that he had that included um, as an adult going to Europe on this trip um, and staying in Spain and recovering all the presences of peoples of African descent, including Juan de Padeja in this early modern Spanish period. I think from that first space, maybe if there's an object, it's maybe a group of objects, are the photo album pages of that journey, which are so wonderfully immediate, I think quite kind of touching in their intimacy. They're, they're handwritten on by him, uh, the little photos, that, and then that he captions them. And then... In the subsequent spaces, it might well be uh, something like the Murillo Three Boys that you know very well, Madeline. The, the real impetus for the show was always the Velasquez portrait of Juan de Preja here at the Met. So that's probably the other. And then the last key object, uh, if you had to pick a top four, maybe I think you allowed us three, but I'll say four, <laughs> is, is certainly the, the, the work by uh, Juan de Preja, The Calling of St. Matthew, that includes his self-portrait, which was always a, a key object for us to, to essentially conclude with. 
So actually to jump around a little bit and kind of um, focus in particular on the Schomburg portion of this story. One of my favorite aspects of the exhibition is that you all started with that story. It's, you know, in, in some ways you're going chronologically backwards. Um, and I love that introduction. And I would love to hear more about why you chose to begin the exhibition in this particular way. And Vanessa in particular, if you could give a little bit of background about who Arturo Schomburg was, this is, I know your you know, particular area of expertise. So David reached out to me in December of 2020 after he had found an article written by Arturo Schomburg titled In Quest of Juan de Pareja. And he then read my book, I think. And and I was able to contextualize for him what that article was because he had found in his research, given the bibliography written on uh, Juan de Pareja, that there was very little in the early 20th century. And so I uh, quote David as saying that he was more famous in the 18th and 19th century than he was in the early 20th century. And so... Arturo Schomburg, as I said, was born in the Spanish colony of Puerto Rico, comes to New York at 17 years old, uh, gets swept up in anti-Spain fervor because this was a site of organizing and mobilizing for, by Afro-Cubans and Afro-Puerto Ricans for independence for those islands. After the Spanish-American War or the Third War of Cuban Independence ends, um, he remains in New York City and he continues to be really fascinated and intentional about collecting everything related to global Black history. So I, I want to really specify this is Jim Crow United States, right? So he's here from 1891. This is the tail end of Reconstruction. And on the rise, it really is, you know, this, this continuing effort to deny that African Americans had made any contribution, meaningful contribution, um, to the United States. This is almost 30 years prior to the Harlem Renaissance, which is the moment when he gets famous, right? And he is famous for famous for two reasons. One, because over the course of his life, he amasses this huge collection of more than 10,000 items, books and pamphlets and prints and musical scores, like anything and everything related to black, black people. So these are things written by black peoples. For example, he was one of the first people that were really collecting Phyllis Wheatley, 18th century African-American poet. People would go out to his house to view this collection. So we have, you know, there's archival evidence of Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes going out to Brooklyn. Everyone knew about his collection. He was also deeply involved already with the 135th Street Branch Library in Harlem, which decades after his death, would be renamed in his honor. And so in 1925, he writes The Negroes Accept His Past, which is a call to action, um, saying that, and the Negro, using the parlance of the, of the day, needed to recover all evidences of his past in order to, essentially to combat white supremacy, right? These efforts of erasing Black history. And so that is published in the New Negro Anthology. And then in 1926, he sells his collection to the Carnegie Corporation for the explicit purpose of donation to the 135th Street Library. These objects are objects that span centuries. One of the objects in the show is a book by Juan Latino, who is a professor of classics at the University of Granada, 16th century text. I say this because... In a U.S. context, there continues to be a great emphasis on African-American studies. What Arturo Schomburg's contribution was, was a multilingual, multinational, very wide definition of Blackness that included Hispanophone, Frank Francophone, all of these histories. After he donates his collection, he continues doing this work. So it's the summer of 1926. He goes to, to Europe. Uh, his first stop is Spain, but he goes to France, he goes to Great Britain, he goes to Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany. He's going to churches, to museums, to archives, to libraries, getting all of the documentation that he needed to write about the early modern presence of African communities and communities of, of African descent um, in these spaces. And so the library that is named after him is called the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. It is one of the four research libraries of the New York Public Library. Anyone doing research on anything related to Black peoples on this planet, that library now has over 11 million items, has five divisions. And you'd be surprised at how many people here in the United States do not know about the Schomburg Center. It was one of my 
intentions of this exhibition was to not only highlight the man, but also highlight that his living legacy is this, is this space in Harlem on 135th Street and Lenox Avenue. I think curatorially, definitely, that was something that I, I think has been really effective, particularly among students who are thinking about these questions, was to introduce them literally in the most practical sense to you just go to 135th Street uh, and you can have access to all this material. But, but also, I think for us, in terms of deciding to start the exhibition with him and this sort of reverse chronology that, that you mentioned, we were doing a presentation of kind of work in progress and literally on PowerPoint, uh, it had always come at the end because it seemed like, oh, well, it's sort of the, you know, the, the spread of his story of kind of after African diaspora and sort of looking back. But then we thought, well, what if we actually put them at the beginning and you step into the past through him? And thankfully, people seem to get it. The biggest fear was there were too many names and locations. Are we in Harlem? Are we in Rome? Are we, you know what? But people seem on the whole to understand it. And I think one of the great things about opening with Schomburg, A, he's such a compelling figure, but he also, his story really opens up the question about the nature of historical research, that it's not an innocent activity, it has a politics, um, you make decisions in the archive all the time. To kind of foreground that just in a broader sense about the nature of what this kind of recovery work looks like. But also, you know, I think it's just a really telling reality that it was only through Google Books that I encountered Schomburg's article in the crisis, the NAACP's journal. It was nowhere to be found in the literature on our painting. Some of our critics uh, will say, oh, it's a very trendy, you know, the show is appealing to the now in a certain way. And I mean, I hope so. Like, we, that's sort of our job is to, you know, to speak to the present. But a lot of the questions that seem so important and pressing now were important and pressing in the 1920s. And it's just that those questions were not being asked inside this building at that point. Uh, and so we really wanted to kind of give that due of saying a lot of these issues have been discussed in, in different communities outside this building for a long time. And so to kind of foreground him as a sort of quasi curatorial presence that was sort of a decentering further of curatorial voice in a way, that sense of who's asking the questions and, and when. No, it's so effective in the exhibition. I mean, for all the reasons that you have outlined, but particularly, um, you know, David, as you were saying at the end here about these questions have been asked many times before, you know, they're not new, even though we feel very much like they are new because they've been um, ignored in particular spaces. It also felt like in starting like that, you have a bit of a I don't know, a guide, you know, introducing you to a more distant past. Schomburg to me in that, you know, becomes almost like a, a scholar who's kind of taking me along a journey. And that is thread is, I think, pulled out throughout the rest of the exhibition really beautifully. But that goes to another question that I've had is if you could share a little bit more about the origins of the exhibition. But I know that this exhibition has been in the works for a while. As many people will know, the Met has had Velasquez's portrait of Juan de Pareja in its collection since 1971. You know, obviously, decades later, this is the first time for there to be the first exhibition on him, but kind of how that first came to light. Sure. Um, it's, you know, it's something that actually certainly preceded my arrival at the Met, which was almost four years ago. So, you know, I think the idea of an exhibition around the Velasquez had been sort of kicked around for years, literally. Uh, the question was how to do it, what to do. Would it be a Velasquez show? Would it be, I mean, uh, would it be about Juan de Pareja? Where, where was the emphasis going to land? Uh, how large was it going to be? Those of you familiar with our exhibition spaces, this is in the Lehman Wing, and there's a space in there that's often used for sort of single works, a highlighted work. So originally the, the exhibition was sort of in there, pretty intimate thing. Uh, that's about the time I arrived at the museum. And then it became evident really in a sense that the richness and complexity of the story was so much more vast than that would allow. It felt really new that in many ways to look at the so-called golden age of Spanish painting in this totally other fashion. What could be more at the heart of Spanish culture than Velasquez's studio, where he's enslaved for, for over two decades? I mean, you're, you're really working from the center out. It's not you're coming in nibbling at the edges of history. Um, and so in that sense, it became a way to really try to, how can we open this to something bigger? And I think certainly in the end, and you know this from being on the advisory committee and also Vanessa, your dialogue on this was key, was for the museum, where would we land in terms of, is the attention resoundingly on the sitter? as it had really never been, or on the portraitist, on Velasquez. In terms of marketing, you know, will we sort of be forced in some fashion to put Velasquez's very famous name out there? But in the end, we felt confident that we should go ahead with only using Juan de Pareja's name on the exhibition catalog, where we have his self-portrait on the front, and the Met's 
admittedly, for now at least, more famous portrait uh, on the back. Uh, there was, a, I think, early days of this exhibition, there would have been no real discussion. The signature image, as, as we call it in the building, the one that's on the banner, etc., would have just been obviously the Met's painting. But, but hopefully we, you know, we, we, re, we rerouted that. But I do really appreciate all of the conversation that we had. I mean, even the, the role of slavery, where were we going to land on that? The, the conversation regarding Velasquez, we almost necessarily had to foreground the fact that he owns Juan de Pareja. So the decision to really focus not on a legal condition, but in fact, on the man himself, what we know of him. When I first started working with David in 2019, I mean, we know the world opens up in the summer of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. The fact that this was a conversation already happening at the Met prior to that is deeply important to me, just as a New Yorker, in fact, as someone who loves these spaces. That was exactly something I wanted to emphasize. Most people will think that this is this exhibition is a product of 2020. And obviously its conversation is shaped by, you know, all of the kind of cultural reckoning and dialogues we've been having collectively, you know, as museums since 2020. But that it was, you know, Vanessa, as you're emphasizing, its inception comes from much earlier. David, do you know exactly how it got proposed? I don't think it had ever been really formally formally proposed until I arrived. As as Vanessa says, part of my interview, literally for my for my job, it was sort of like, well, we kind of want to do something around this painting. What would you do? And so within the first months of being here, I went through the more standard process that we do of proposing it. So that was the first time it had really been given given a shape. Yeah, we did even at one point toy with, uh, and there was certainly support in the building for it to be a much bigger exhibition. It's sort of, I would say, medium size. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons we stuck with medium size, we had a very specific kind of material and argument that we wanted to make and to stay focused in that way. And it, we didn't really want it to get kind of watered down. And one of the things actually with the advisory committee that became important on that, which I often credit them with giving us the confidence to stick with, the specificity of Spain, not going into the Atlantic world, for example, which it could have. I mean, in a certain way, it could have, and that would be a next step. But it felt as though the story remains new enough and strange enough, frankly. Uh, the nature of this multiracial society in which slavery is so widespread in Spain, and for most people, of course, that's the part that they find so difficult to kind of reckon with, is like you know, people have accustomed themselves to the idea that this is the kind of labor that's happening in the Americas. But I think that, you know, this kind of bringing it home aspect is one of the more alarming features. And so by sort of digging into that rather than kind of watering that down, that seemed important. Realizing actually it might be good to just take a couple of steps back and just describe basic biographical facts about Juan de Pereja, who he was, what's kind of the broader historical landscape that we're dealing with in terms of 17th century Spain. So Juan de Pereja was born around 1608. In Antiqueta, which is in southern Spain. It's not so far from where Velasquez is from in Seville. He doesn't appear again in the archives until 1634, by which point he's with Velasquez uh, in Madrid at the court. Uh, and it's just an incidental thing. We, he appears again. It's actually the, the marriage of Velasquez's daughter. They list everybody who's in the room. He's in the room. So that's the first moment we know that they're in the same space. He then is with Velasquez, uh, enslaved by Velasquez for uh, almost two decades or around that amount of time. The key historical moment is 1650, uh, which is when Velasquez travels to, to Italy, specifically really to buy works of art for the King of Spain, but along the way he paints, including the portrait of Juan de Pereja. And it's also in that year, and this was key for us to bring in that document, uh, Juan de Pereja receives the papers from, from Velasquez, who signs legal documents that free him after the space of another four years. Then that allows essentially for him to have his own independent artistic career as a painter uh, for the last probably 12, 15 years of his life before he dies in, in Madrid in 1670. Basically, once Velasquez enters your life, you, you start to get pretty well documented. Uh, so at that point, mainly because documents around Velasquez were sort of always treasured, it's easier to figure out some of the details, although there's plenty we're still determining. The first of the 17th century sections really deals with trying to outline for people a world in which you have a city like Seville that historians estimate are about 15 to 20 percent of the population were people of color, a deliberately kind of broad term because the terminology of the documents is broad. And of that, 80 percent of those people are enslaved. These are people you encounter uh, all the time. And if you're kind of middle class or higher, you actually live with and probably own one of these people. 
In a strange way, because for the first 30 years of his life, we don't know uh, many details about Wanda Pereja, it actually allowed us to open up the story a bit. So basically that first section really tries to say, well, what's the realm of possibility? What did the society look like? What was labor like in the society? Um, where were these people coming from? A lot of it was sort of learning on our side. I mean, a lot of this was pretty new to me as well. It was a bit of a shock to learn the extent of this kind of labor in Spain. And I, I also would like to just add, uh, as David just mentioned about the 80% who were enslaved, that means 20% were free, right? And I say that because certainly on tours, we've gotten questions about was Juan de Padre the only person, right, who was free? We have both been on the receiving end of reactions from the Spanish reporters. I've met in that space, you know, visitors to the Met who are shocked, right? If you're looking at social media, shocked at this history that they themselves are not taught in Spain at this moment. And I remember having a, a conversation with a reporter where I said, this is your history. And so for myself, I'm, I'm incredibly ecstatic at the prospect of what this, this exhibition can do in terms of interest with regard to Black European histories as a field. You know, in that photo album I mentioned of Schomburg, there are photos where he goes to the part of town in Seville that he knew was traditionally associated with people of color. He goes to the traditional black confraternity and they're very haunting photographs because the streets are empty and it kind of is a poetic reflection of what we know from what he's writing about, which he's surprised to find that in fact, the visibility of that population is sort of no more. Uh, he seems to find one person is the last known descendant of that black confraternity because by the time he shows up, the saints in there are black, etc. but all the people are white. I mean, Spanish white, We can that's a separate topic. But essentially they don't look like as expected. That lack of visibility in the population for him is not so dissimilar for I think a lot of people now in Spain where their assumption is people whose origins are in Africa are recent immigrants. And it's essentially because with the slave trade, you end up with a population that spikes in the 17th century and then into the 18th century, into the 19th century, that population has either died out or married into other populations. And so literally it's just not there. There's this sort of gap uh, in the history in Spain. Well, I, I mean, but it is also a gap that encompasses not knowing that Morocco was a protectorate for decades, not acknowledging Equatorial Guinea as its only colony. And that relationship between that space, the Caribbean, it is vast and broad. Spain's racist national imaginary, and this is an ongoing. We have very similar conversations. We can talk about the United States and its and, and current fights uh, against Black history. And the reason that Abdullah Schomburg seems so present is that the continual onslaught and insistence on Black peoples having no history um, is one that is rooted also right in this early modern period. His directive, history must restore what slavery took away, one of the quotes that we include in the exhibition uh, is precisely because of that, right? Because in not knowing these histories, then one can say, oh, well, these peoples writ large have no history. We don't have to count them with regards to anything. They have no influence with regards to how we move forward, be it politically, be it socially, be it culturally. That is the fight that, that peoples of African descent have had, not only in the United States, throughout the Americas, and in fact, you know, as this proves, in the European continent as well. Vanessa, I'm really glad you brought up that quote because it leads me exactly into my next question, which is Schomburg's quote is in the exhibition put, you know, very prominently, boldly above Velasquez's portrait of Pareja. And I think that is that was just a brilliant curatorial move. You know, one, in thinking about how history is one of the only ways we can restore what slavery took away. I mean, this exhibition is doing just that. Your work has done just that. But it really is a call to action, I felt, in, in seeing it for future scholars. That this is an important contribution, but the beginning, that there's more to be done. And so curious about what are some next steps that you would like to see current and future scholars within the field contribute further to the narratives um, being told within the exhibition? Well, first, I want to give David lots of credit, not only in terms of selecting the Schomburg narratives to be included, but also even by the time I had joined this, a year almost into his research, his decision to juxtapose the Velasquez portrait of Juan de Padeja, the Velasquez portrait of Pope Innocent X, and place the manumission documents between these two was already 
in his mind. And so that to me was also astounding, the fact that we would include the actual documents. I think for me, what is most important is always to question, right? I mean, again, there are fictions that we just absorb you know, in this kind of hegemonic way, this kind of, oh, okay, well, these are the narratives, capital N. I've started to get irritated by the word representation because it, it belies a kind of superficiality, right? We're talking inclusion. We're talking people's, the acknowledgement and recognition that there were peoples there on the grounds contributing to these spaces. And so for me personally, for example, you know, oftentimes in the United States, there's the binary of white and black and Asian cultures writ large uh, get erased, right? So whether it be South Asian, East Asian, they too, right, were present. And so for me, what I would love, certainly on the European context, uh, is, is just to open it up in some ways, the knowledge about trade routes, right, with the East, quote unquote, are better known in the 17th century than they are today in the 21st, you know? And so that to me is astounding. I, I would just ask scholars to just try to shift your perspective or at least ask the questions, you know, ask, are we, are we including everyone that we could be including in this moment? I deeply hope that people go to archives. Again, I have found myself when people ask, is Juan de Pareja the only one? You know, I start talking about Jose Campeche, the Puerto Rican painter. I start talking about Alicia Gino, who is a 18th century wood craftsman in the church, the churches of Brazil in Minas Gerais. I mean, there are these stories and we haven't drawn the entire picture, <laughs> David. <laughs> um, gosh, whatever I propose is so, so minor uh, compared to that very wonderful grand hope. Yeah, I mean, I think th in terms of questioning assumptions, if you accept the empirical evidence that we put out there, it's so jarring because it totally flips what you thought you knew. I mean, like in a deep way. So basically you're left in this with this feeling that 17th century Spanish art and visual culture is underwritten by enslaved labor, left, right, and center. It's not an offshore thing, blah, blah, blah. And so in that sense, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. We have to rethink all of these kind of paintings and things that we that we thought we knew. And so that, that kind of jarringness, and, and I kind of can sense it, it's almost to the extent, you can almost see why people do ignore it. And it's because it's so unsettling as a reality, that if you accept it, then a lot of your assumptions are sort of thrown out the window. And that's jarring. That's that takes a lot of kind of, whoa, you have to kind of resettle. Of course, in terms of other things people can be doing, I think Vanessa and I tried to leave as many breadcrumbs in the catalog, etc. You know, Vanessa being an educator, a much better uh, sense of saying, look, this is for future generations. It's okay that we don't have every answer. We can we can propose these as things people can pursue. And that's exciting. And I think we'll, if, literally to the factual level about reconstructing Juan de Preja's life. The final thing I guess I would say is, is back to what you had said, and I'm flattered that you found this installation effective. So, you know, this quotation from Schomburg is above the Met's very famous painting. It's quite large font uh, on a quite bright kind of fiery orange. And, you know, and I'd always, I had always envisioned the manumission document. I always said, I kept saying to the design people and the lighting people, I want it to be like the Hope Diamond in the middle of the room, like a kind of dark room. And you just sort of see this beautiful object. And it is strangely beautiful. And, and I, I have to say several people have mentioned how, how kind of emotional that encounter is, which I couldn't have really anticipated. But I would say, you know, the stuff arrives from design, you see the huge quotation, you see the fiery wall, and you think, oh no, what have I done? You know, it's like possibly, you know, maybe I went too far in one direction or the other. But I think that in terms of learning from the exhibition, you know, the painting will go back and live in our permanent collection galleries for the rest of time, and it will have its little label. And we hope to incorporate these narratives as much as we can into those permanent collection galleries. But an exhibition is really an opportunity to take a certain number of risks, I think, and say, look, it's a painting that's hung on wires. It can be moved. It can be put back in its very tame setting. The juxtaposition of these objects is, you know, it's only for a few months and you can play a little bit with that and see what happens. Uh, and so I think in that sense, it's a strong painting. People get nervous about, oh, this is going to destroy Velasquez. It's like, Velasquez is fine. I mean, actually, he's really, he, he's not going to fall from the canon probably ever. You can be straightforward about the nature of these stories. The works can take it. His biography, his place in historiography can can handle this kind of reevaluation. I do also want to add to that. We were always very aware of where we were, 
you know, certainly I, as the, as the co-curator, as the guest curator of this exhibition, I was very aware that I'm at the Metropolitan Museum. I was not at MoMA PS1. For those who, without having seen it, are anticipating perhaps a condemnation of Diego Velasquez as a slave owner. Um, that was not our intention. It was to say these were the facts, period. This is the context. This is the historical context. These are other painters who also did this within a Spanish context. I love the three boys, Mujerillo's three boys in this exhibition because I use it to demonstrate the racialized codes that we all bring to that painting. I do also want to say out loud, this is not just Spain. Yesterday, the Fundación por la Memoire de los Esclavos had a conference showing a short film of a rebellion in 1745 in Scotland, for example, that enslaved peoples in Scotland in the 18th century had risen up, right? And so this is not just the Mediterranean. This is not just Spain. The Danish Empire in its relationship with, its, with enslavement, the Dutch in, in relationship with enslavement, the relationship with the Ottoman Empire, there is so much work to do. So I really want to emphasize that in full recognition, again, of the complexities and the nuances that exist on the European continent at this moment. I mean, the, the contemporary urgency of the need to study this history is so brilliantly communicated by the exhibition. I think it's part of the reason I wanted to ask this question about future scholars is that I think exhibitions like this inspire the next generation of scholars that we need to be pursuing all of these questions, particularly from you know the angles of art history as well, and reminding young people who are thinking about going into our field that we really we really need them to be pursuing all of these avenues. And there's so many directions in which their work can go, and so many questions that that need to be asked. And I love how you specifically thought about that, not only in the exhibition, but with the catalog as well. It's an excellent catalog that everybody should purchase, especially if you're not going to have a chance to go to New York and see the exhibition. One of you mentioned breadcrumbs and how we can still pick up these stories and pick up these narratives and kind of continue on with this research and this work, even after the exhibition is gone. And so just curious in thinking about how you were thinking about this approach when you were conceiving of the catalog and what ways that you were maybe... Um, approaching this differently from a more traditional exhibition catalog because of that? I think probably the key thing for me that I felt was so important that it include a complete list, or as best we could, of works by Wanda Pereja, because he's been treated for so long as a kind of almost historical curiosity, that it was as if he wasn't an artist himself, as if the works themselves suddenly were secondary. And so it became really key that part of the task of the catalog would be to try to reconstruct a body of works that are by him, some of them determining they're not by him, to give them a sense of chronology, to get a sense of his sources of influence. Really one of the most radical things you could do is the most old fashioned connoisseurial activity, which is reconstructing this, because in a sense, that's something that you know, is within my, supposedly within my skill set. And as a museum, as a Met, as the Met, as a place that that kind of work is meant to happen, felt like that could be a contribution so that you end up with people who might have, who might be coming at his story from a history perspective, from theories of race perspective, you know, any number of things. It's not their job to determine what is or isn't by Wanda Prey, how that should be part of the Met's job. We also were in the fortunate position to go off into rural areas of Spain and photograph for the first time paintings and publish them in color for the first time. It will be corrected, modified endlessly, I'm sure, as it is for any painter when you're starting to kind of figure out what is or isn't by someone. And we were both really intentional about it living up to the other catalogs that Met Publications publish. Let us have a beautiful object and treating him with that kind of care. But I think that that's something you, you had mentioned in a design meeting, I remember at one point, the question, you know, they offer you different options. And there was the, the sort of trendy option that would look kind of cool and like very of the moment, like palette wise, font wise. And I think, you know, I perhaps my own sensibilities lean, you know, I do early modern painting, it leaned more conservative, but, but actually, Vanessa, your argument for the more conservative approach visually for the catalog was much more, no, 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 we want him to be situated as, as if you were writing a catalog on Velasquez, almost canonizing in a sense. The other thing to say on that is I think throughout, 
we were aware of the exhibition and hopefully the catalog of being a sort of bridge between different people who are coming at it from different sides, from people who love Velazquez or love, you know, traditional Spanish painting, you know, because it sort of looks the way that they expect an exhibition to look and that kind of thing. No, you achieve that beautifully through the catalog and that intentionality and really the thought put into each decision makes it this really delicious, fantastic read. 